be looking at 3D maps, homogeneous coordinates, projections. So if we look at 3D affine maps, we'll quickly introduce those and look at how we do translations in 3D, talk about how to compute affine maps as 3D to 3D mappings, and then we'll talk about the very important types of projections from 3D down to 2D, since we'd like to see things on our screens and on paper. Uh, so we'll look at parallel projections, then we'll introduce the very important concept of homogeneous coordinates and perspective maps and uh, summarize with a bunch of uh, words you should know. So again, affine maps in 3D are really just like affine maps were in 2D, except we're in 3D. They allow us to represent the transformations of space from one 3D space to another. It's also very important as we want to try and do things like compute graphics and compute ways of representing our world and project it down. Uh, so affine maps are a, uh, are a place to start, and then we'll talk about perspective projections as well. So similar in 2D, we're going to take our affine maps in 3D. We're going to have a basis vector, E1, E2, E3. We're going to map it to some new space, A1, A2, A3. And we can ask if, if it's represented as X in one space, it's X prime in another. And a 3D affine map is similar. We're going to have some point P plus a matrix A times X minus O. O allows us to move X to some new place, rotate it or transform it using the affine matrix A, and then put it back to some new location. Uh, so uh, in general, if you assume the origin is zero, we already start with it, then we can drop it and just write the affine transformation as P plus AX, which is just sort of like what we had in 2D. Affine maps have some important properties. The first of these is that affine maps leave ratios invariant. So if I look at the length of a line, I cut it in half, the midpoint is a ratio between the two points that will be uh, mapped. Um, and the body in that sense becomes a, a nice rigid body. Uh, if I look at fine maps, they take parallel planes to parallel planes and intersecting planes to intersecting planes. And the intersection of the mapped plane is the mapping of the original intersection. Just like for lines, the point of intersection after mapping is the intersection of the point after mapping. So another important property that is very useful for graphics is that affine maps leave barycentric coordinates or combinations invariant. So if I look at some point X in the original space and I represent it as some combination C1 times P1 plus C2 times P2 plus C3 times P3 and C4 times C4, as I represent it as a location within this tetrahedron, then after I do an affine map, I get to use the exact same coefficients to each of the transformed points, and it will be left alone. Um, and therefore, it's convenient for us to use in terms of representing points in graphics using a barycentric or an affine uh, coordinate system, then it's, a, it's unaffected by affine transformations. Um, if I want to move stuff around in 3D, translation is simply a very special affine map where the uh, matrix A is the identity map, and we start at the origin, so I can move stuff around uh, translation is a rigid body motion, the volume of the object doesn't change, and of course this makes it useful if I want to place things in uh, space and say in my graphics world. If I want to actually figure out uh, what is the affine map that does something, a little bit like we do with a triangle, analogous to that, we're going to do it with uh, here, uh, but here it's not going to be a triangle, it's going to be a tetrahedron. So if you're given four points in the original space and four points in the transform space, you can determine and hit the tetrahedron uh, and its image that allows you to map from the first space to the second. Um, one way of doing that is since we know that the affine map leaves barycentric combinations unchanged, I can represent a point X as uh, an affine set of those, uh, any point X can be represented as a barycentric combination of those four original points. And then the new space, I know it's going to be the same four coefficients times the four points. So I have the original points, I have the uh, transformed points, all I have to do is figure out what is u. But if I look at this equation for u, even though we've read it here in vector notation, you can recognize that this is actually three equations, because there's an equation for x, an equation for y, an equation for z, but u1, u2, u3, and u4 are just constants. So this gives me, this start equation gives me three equations and three unknowns. Uh, I get one more equation, because I know from my barycentric coordinates, u1, u2, u3, u4 have to equal 1. That's just property of what they want to be for a barycentric. So that ends up giving me four equations and four unknowns, and I can go ahead and solve it. Um, analogous to what we did in triangles, we can solve things that way. So if I have these four points uh, given by p, the origin, and the three basis vectors, and I want to map that to uh, uh, 
the point zero 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 minus one zero zero um, zero minus one whatever I'm actually going to sort of flip it over and then I could ask in the original space there was the point one 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 which is none of my original points but I can ask where it gets mapped uh, you can sort of see here graphically we're really sort of taking the tetrahedron the unit tetrahedron that goes from the origin to each of the basis uh, zero one zero one zero zero right uh, and then the transform space is the flipped version of that so you can see where you expect x prime is going to be going to minus one minus one minus one but let's actually derive the transformation matrix so if we set up those four equations in this case we can see it's minus two uh, times the basis plus zero plus this plus this we put all those coordinates together so that i can map one 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 my barycentric point into those with those four basis vectors note they sum to one and now we just take the new final points, put in those barycentric coordinates, um, and then we get minus one, minus one, minus one. So that approach worked. Uh, it's not always so trivial. In this case, it was trivial because our basis vectors were so nice um, to figure out what the uh, barycentric coordinates for the point will have to be. Um, so another way of doing this is a little bit like we do with the triangles, constructed with a slightly different approach. If we assume we have a general point P, one as the origin, last time, the last example we had zero as the origin, but if I assume we have P1 as the origin, I can subtract it from each of the other three points and I get three vectors. And the coordinate system of the P prime is in Z, so we can do the same thing for each of those. And now we want to find a three by three matrix A and the point P that describes the affine map going that X prime is equal to A times the quantity X minus P1, end of quantity, plus P1 prime. So that lets me map Okay, so I'm going to map these. Okay. Now, if we derive this, we can do that for each of the points. So we get a nice representation. And we can write that in matrix form. And we get that the matrix A, to solve for what is A, A is going to be the difference of P2 prime minus P1 prime. It's a column vector. P3 prime minus P1 as a column vector. P4 prime minus P1 prime. This is analogous again to what we did in the triangle here. We're just looking at each of the column vectors formed by taking the origin in the original, sp uh, the transform space, the origin in the original space, subtracting it from each of the points now in our tetrahedron, turning them into a matrix, and then I get the, f the desired matrix where I want things to go in terms of a vector, times the inverse, notice the minus one here, the inverse of that tetrahedron in the original space. So revisiting the last example where we had, uh, there was no translation, so when I just do the subtractions, I get the uh, a straightforward set of processes, and then I get x prime is equal to uh, the, the second matrix, our, orig our origin matrix, this part over here, turns out to just be the identity matrix, so that's pretty easy. Um, and so the inverse, the, the s desired matrix, I just write that down, minus ones in, the, in each of these columns, or minus one, zero, zero. And now I have to take their product, um, so, which of course is the identity matrix, so it leaves things alone. So A is the product of these two, which is just this one. And then X prime is given by this matrix A times 1, 1, 1, which gives me the, the point. Um, this approach for a single point is about the same as a barycentric coordinate, but once I have this matrix A, I could apply this transformation to every point in a polygon or every point on the teapot and make a much more complicated transformation. So solving for the transformation this way gives you a matrix you can directly use. So now we get to maybe the more important part of this chapter, homogeneous coordinates and perspective maps. So it turns out that there's a really clever way of, of representing our affine transformations in what we call a homogeneous transformation matrix. And we'll look at this in two different ways. First, to look at it algebraically, we're going to represent AX plus B into one matrix multiplication. So I can say X prime is equal to M times X. I'm going to do this by extending it to have a fourth dimension in my vector. So I'm going to have x1, x2, x3, and I'm going to add a 1 at the end. Um, and now x prime, where I want to map to, is the same kind of representation. And from that, I can get that my matrix a, M is going to be represented as this 4x4 four four matrix, where the upper 3x3 three three submatrix is just uh, the values a11, uh, a12, and so. Um, the right-hand column is p1, p2, p3, where p1, p2, p3 are the translation I want to do. And the bottom row is three zeros and a one. Okay? And it, if you just work through the algebra, you'll see that this matrix, right, M, times X, will give you X prime exactly as if you had done this, 
where you then sort of have to ignore the last component of the of x prime and x after you get them if you want to get them exactly analogous to here. So this homogeneous representation has some other nice properties. In this representation, if I start with a vector v, and I say it's a vector, well, a vector will have the, the, the value uh, x, uh, v1, v2, v3, and 0. So now we actually see a difference. Points are represented in homogeneous coordinates as uh, a value x1, x2, x3, and the value 1 saying it's a point. Vectors are v1, v2, v3, and 0. And now the interesting thing is when I multiply a vector times a matrix that has these translation components in the right-hand side, I get a translated point. When I multiply a vector times that matrix, because the last element of the vector is zero, it ignores this last column, and I get back a vector. So now in homogeneous coordinates, we get that points and vectors are a little bit different. They are both four-element arrays, but the last element of a vector is zero. The last element of a point is one. And this now lets me deal with things in a very nice and effective way where I can have vectors and points slightly different. I can multiply matrices times points and get points, multiply homogeneous matrices times vectors and get vectors. Okay. And because points all end in 1, if I subtract two points, I get a vector because it will end in 0. So now I want to show you a little bit of what homogeneous coordinate systems sort of mean in a, in a graphical way and also to sort of show you why in this uh, homogeneous coordinate space we get this uh, extra uh, property of translation. So if I think of my, my, my original space, I'm going to do 2D homogeneous coordinates here going to 3D um, instead of 3 to 4, it's a little easier to see. So I had a 2D space, I have some shape in it, but now my homogeneous version, I lift up to have my third coordinate z equals 1, and the matrices I'm going to use are going to allow me to, to manipulate that space, but on the plane z equals 1, anytime I would effectively shear the, the, the space, the shear in 3D produces a translation in 2D. Rotations still produce rotation, so the matrix part of the, uh, of the homogeneous coordinate is sort of left alone. But when I take that 2D space, I'm going to take it, I'm going to lift it up. This gives me my homogeneous space, and I'm working in this space. And right now we're sort of thinking of this space and projecting orthographically or obliquely down. But now any, any skewing I do in 3D space becomes this translation. So this is where that, the connection becomes, and it's sort of interesting. It's also clear that if I, here I chose z equals 1, I could actually generalize and deal with a much broader space. Um, anything I want in, in terms of uh, that space, can, I can have, uh, if my last value is not equal to 1, I then have to deal with what homogeneous. It's actually like homogeneous is a stack of planes where the last value is the fourth coordinate. And if that coordinate is some other value, it's a, it's a, a corresponding point. So, in fact, I can think of my 3D point, minus 1, minus 1, 3. In homogeneous coordinates, I could also think of that same point as being 10, minus 10, 30, 10, or 1, minus 1, 3, 1, or minus 2, 2, minus 6, minus 2. So these are correspondence. In fact, what we normally end up doing is, after we do some calculations, if the last point is not equal to 1, we're going to divide through it so that it becomes 1 to be a point. Of course, there's going to be one problem. What do you see having a problem if I would divide through by that last coordinate? Well, if the last coordinate is 0, I'm going to have to have something special. So I'm going to have to treat those points specially, and we're going to look at that next. So let's go back and revisit our problem of projection for a second. Um, in our homogeneous coordinate space, if I want to project a point x, given some projection direction v, uh, onto some projection plane, uh, x prime minus q dot n, right? This gives me a definition of a plane. Then the projected point in this space becomes x prime uh, L minus V N transpose V dot N times X plus Q dot N V dot N times V. Okay, so this is actually something we, we pretty much saw. This is not homogeneous. This is just the definition. Well, it turns out that we can actually, because this, if you look at it, is a little bit like an affine transformation, I can put this into our matrix. So I can write V dot N as an identity matrix minus V N transpose. Okay, that actually gives me this piece here. Because I want to have this added translation, I'm going to get v dot n times v. Now, the last thing is you'll notice that both of these actually are divided by v dot n. Uh, 
So we're going to put v.n down here in our bottom right-hand corner because that turns out to be a global scaling. So I can take what looked like our projection problem and I can represent it in, uh, in our, as an ortho orthographic oblique projection into this form. And this gives me our generalized projection matrix in homogeneous matrix form. Now I want to talk a little bit about perspective projections because they're particularly important for graphics and very common for how we want to view the world. So to first understand projective project perspective projection, we actually want to think of it in terms of a pinhole camera model or what we call the camera obscura. It was actually the first camera d discovered. Um, doesn't have a lens. If I take the world and I poke a small hole in the side of my tent and I live in a very sunny area of the Middle East, which is where it was first discovered, it turns out that the world, a ray of light leaving an object in the world will go through that hole and project onto the wall of my tent. Now it turns out it projects upside down um, and working in an upside down world is a little confusing. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a plane in front of the pinhole but effectively do the same thing. And now what's interesting is we can say every point in the world is going towards this pinhole, this one dot. And we're going to put the plane out in front and we're going to capture what happens as the rays go through that plane. Real cameras, in fact, even your eye, sees the world's upside down. It's not easy for you to imagine that you're seeing the world upside down, but the way your eye works, the top of the world is on the bottom of your eye. And if you were to, for example, get a torn retina and you tear the top of your retina, you lose the ability to see the bottom of the ground because it's the top of your eye. Um, okay, so perspective projections are things we normally see. And one of the things they produce uh, is this idea of lines that were parallel in fact, in this space, right, all the lines are going to go through the, the, the center of the camera lens. Turns out that depending on how you set up your camera and where you do things, what you're going to get is what we call perspective projections. And lines that are parallel in the world appear to converge. Things that are farther away from you get to come to the, to the get, seem to get closer and closer together. This is all intuitive to you. When you look far out, you know that when you see something, it seems that far away things are closer than when they're up uh, are, are vertically closer than things that are close to you. Um, and this is actually an important cue of depth for you. So you know how things, far away things are based on how convergent those lines are. But this also means we can't use a pure fine projection because a fine projections map parallel lines to parallel lines. So we need a new kind of projection, which we call a perspective projection. Instead of having a constant direction for what we're going to do, perspective projections depend on the point themselves. The points that are farther away are going to be projected differently than those that are close. And it turns out we can write down that equation that in our, uh, our x prime is going to be x, where it originally started. If we map through these planes and figure out what is the, the, the spacing is going to be, we're going to get q minus x dot n times x divided by x dot n. And this way, as I get points that are farther away, q minus x keeps changing. The direction of this point is q minus x, 3. The direction of this point is q minus x, 1. It's a different direction. And so those directions change what the perspective projection does. If we want to write that in homogeneous coordinate systems, we're going to have uh, i times q minus n, zeros, zeros, and x dot n is our normalizing factor. Um, and don't worry if you don't see exactly where it's going to come from for now. Just uh, We'll come back to it in a little bit. But I want to show you that perspective projections are not a fine, and then we'll, we'll talk about showing so we can actually sort of see more intuitively where, where things go with perspective projections. So imagine that I have the plane Z equals 3, and the point on the plane Q is 0, 0, 1. That's just the point we're going to look at. So if I look at n dot, uh, Q dot n, that's 1, and I take a point... Uh, x dot n equals x3, resulting in the map x prime equals 1 over x, uh, 1 over x3 times x. Okay, that's really analogous to what we're looking at right here in this drawing. So now let's take those three points, x1, x2, x3, in this drawing. So I've just defined a plane, I'm doing the projection, I'm projecting down perspectively, down the x3 axis into this plane, um, and sort of scaling everything by a third of its, its uh, x3's distance. So if I take with the points 2, 0, 4, 3, minus 1, 3, and 4, minus 2, 2, that is these three points here. Um, and actually, we're just going to note that the midpoint of uh, x1 and x3 is x2. So this point is halfway in between. After we project them, right, 
we're going to get the projection of this is one half zero one. The projection of uh, x two is one minus one third one, and x three is two minus one one. And this is no longer that x prime has the right properties. It used to be the midpoint, and now it's actually uh, the x two prime is one third of the way over. It's shifted. Okay, and that actually shouldn't be too much of a surprise because we said that points that are farther away move less than points that are close. This point, x1, is much farther away than x3, so it's effectively going to appear to move more when I prospectively project it. So now, just to sort of give you a feel of how we derived what that, that looks like, I'm going to do it, we'll do it sort of in a 1D version first, 1D to 2D. So if I know some point and I know what the distance is for this homogeneous coordinate and I'm doing perspective projection, so I'm thinking my camera, my camera plane is distance D away from the pinhole, what's the projection going to look like? Well, if I look at this from a similar triangle point of view, just forget the other dimensions for a second, look at it sideways, right? I know that I have the distance of D here and this is the height where in the image I want to find it in its 2D coordinate, um, X, uh, X, S, Y, S after projection. And in the real world, we know that this point is out here at the distance z, um, and we're using the sort of graphics convention that this is actually the minus z axis, just this is how we flip the plane over. Um, and so similar triangles say, well, if this point is at x, y, uh, yeah, x, v, y, v, z, v, out in the, the real world, the viewpoint world, after I project it, it's going to end up at x, s, y, s, and similar triangles lets me say that x, s divided by d, this height divided by d is the same as this height divided by v, zv. And the same is true with their y coordinates. So I get both of their coordinates out of this sort of things. So if I want to generalize that to 3D, that then gives us our homogeneous coordinates for simple perspective transformation. Um, we have xs, ys, d, uh, xs, ys, zv, z over d. Okay, and now this is another form of writing it. Um, earlier we wrote one where the left column and the right column were zeros and I put something in this bottom corner. This is an alternative. It turns out that for most homogeneous representations there's more than way, one way of solving it. This way makes it easy for me to see that from my perspective projection I put the focal length, 1 over d, the distance to the, to the camera plane, uh, here in the bottom row and I get a perspective projection. This will map p of v to p of s. Um, so my virtual coordinate system to my projected coordinate system. So now I thought it would be interesting, and this is not in the book, um, show you sort of how do we see where parallel lines uh, converge and where they meet. So if I start with parallel lines, by in parametric form in 3D, I can represent parallel lines as some point x0 plus t times d, where d is the direction vector of, of the line we want to draw. And in parametric form, parallel lines only differ because they have different values of x0. So uh, that gives us our different parallel lines. So now let's go and transform um, and go from homogeneous back to regular coordinates for a second. If I look at those parallel lines, it doesn't really matter what I start with with x0, I write all these out, I'm going to multiply them by my transformation matrix. Um, because it's linear, I know I can actually just take the x0, stick it out here, plus t times our parametric, our parameter, parametric value t times this matrix, right, again, the, the project, perspective projection matrix, times their d, uh, the, the xd component, so where they are on the, in the vector in the direction of going. Now, if I actually think of this, and this is a little bit beyond class y, one of the reasons you don't have to know this, I just want to give you some intuition. If I take the limit as t goes to infinity, so if I think about what happens when I go really far out on the line, in a parametric line, I head off towards infinity, you're going to see that where these things go, uh, where this line goes is it'll be mapped to, in the 2D space, x times uh, f times xd divided by zd, f times yd divided by zd and f, so its transformation in, in the 2 space will just be uh, x fd divided zd. Its 2D projection doesn't depend on x0 anymore. So all parallel lines, all lines that have the same direction vector d, which is x, d, uh, z, d, y, d, z, d, all go to the same point. We call this the point where they meet. Um, we call this the vanishing point because the two lines seem to vanish into that point. 
just as if you watch two railroad tracks that are parallel, they seem to vanish into some point at the distance. And it actually tells you something about the direction you're looking. Um, so in this case, they were, they were converging along the z-axis. That's the way I derived that. What does this matrix do? Well, this matrix is going to make things converge along the y-axis instead of along the z-axis. And in, in the more general setting, you can actually, of course, combine different perspective projections, and you can multiply them, rotate them, and put them together. It's sort of like looking in directions, rotating them, and looking in another direction. You can look at a painting that has a perspective projection in it, and you get a second perspective of that perspective. It can do things as you need to. Um, one last thing about perspective uh, homogeneous transformations. In our book and in this class, we will use pre-multiplication homogeneous matrices. Um, and in these matrices, the sort of rotation part is the upper left 3x3. Three three. The translation is the right-hand side of the uh, first three rows. The bottom three rows have the focal lengths of the perspective projection elements. And the bottom right-hand corner is a scaling, overall scaling. There are, however, other papers and books that will use post-multiplication, which has a rotation component in the uh, upper right-hand part, although the rotations are uh, opposite, clockwise or counterclockwise. They put their focal length or the perspective projection on the right-hand side and their translations on the bottom. So you have to be a little careful whenever you're looking at software libraries, packages, or reading people's papers to make sure you understand when they're doing homogeneous coordinates, are they doing pre-multiplication of a vector or post-multiplication? In fact, that's the easiest way I find to, to recognize it. Look in the, in the paper or the documentation, and if they write A times X, then they're doing pre-multiplication. If they write X times omega, then they're doing post-multiplication, and it's a question of which one is more convenient for their particular representations. Give you a little bit more intuition, look a little bit at graphics, uh, look at some of this stuff graphically. So important properties of perspective maps. They do not preserve ratios of three points. Parallel lines will, be will not be mapped to parallel lines. In general, parallel lines will converge, although not always. You can, you'll see in a second. Um, uh, uh, in general, it's a good model for how we perceive the 3D space around us. So parallel projections, right? lines are parallel, okay, and shapes are retained. In a perspective projection, the shapes are no longer preserved. They actually look more natural to us, um, but we have to be careful what we're going to do with them. Um, this idea of homogeneous coordinate systems actually was invented back in the 14th century. Um, this is a, an early uh, 14th century draw, uh, drawing where they were starting to get into the, the perspectives. Um, and one of the things that was important is they recognized that if I wanted to have good drawings, I needed to make it so that you could look at this drawing and figure out if this was the world, where are you standing relative to this? And it turns out that perspective is an important part of that. So if I were to take this drawing, and now I just take some of the lines that are in the drawing. Right, so these are straight lines on the roof. They converge to a point over here. If I take some other lines in the drawing, these horizontal lines, right, they converge to a point over here. And this convergence of these parallel lines is important. If the lines didn't converge, you don't see the world as proper. Right? Something is not right about it. Um, in fact, when you take classes in art, you, and for those of you who have taken a drawing class, you've probably heard about what they call single point perspective, two point perspective, and three point perspective. And they actually give you very different feeling. In a single point perspective, th this world is very flat, and everything is converging out here to some point on the horizon. But horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical lines here and horizontal lines in the image are actually still parallel. So things that were parallel horizontal or vertically are converged. It's only things in depth that converge. This gives you a feeling of depth, but a feeling of actually the object is pretty far away. In two-point perspective, parallel lines converge to two different perspective points or, or, or uh, vanishing points. And in this case, you get the feeling that the object is bigger and it is far away um, and, and, and converging to the horizon. And in a three-point perspective, which we can think of as a, so either a worm's view or a bird's eye view, all three directions of a cube seem to converge. Right? So in the two-point, the vertical axis right, was small. So the lines seem to be parallel. When we get to something where all three axes are converging, people get the perception that the object is really big, and I'm looking at it from like a helicopter, the bird's eye view, or I'm looking at it from the bottom, but all three axes are so big that you're seeing the vanishing direction. The lines are converging, so I'm pretty far away from them. Um, so this gives people a feeling of what's going on, um, and artists learn this in the 14th century and learn how to take advantage of it.
It also turns out that this idea of uh, perspective points, vanishing points, and lines actually can be very practically useful. Um, it has been used for years to help uh, rectify photographs of images. So if I have a picture of this building, I can go in and I can draw all of the, the vanishing points. I can find all the lines of things that should be parallel. And if I take those and I make them parallel again, so here's I've made the, the green line, uh, sorry, the, the, the frontal lines all parallel by just warping the image. You sort of figure out a transformation to lift this end, the right edge of the image up, and you get a rectified image that looks like you're standing in front of the building where this image looks like you're standing over here on the corner. Um, and you can see this on a regular basis when you do things like use Street View or other transformations that have taken images and rectified them for your use. So a bunch of words you need to make sure you understand for these. So again, uh, you might want to write these down, write down the definitions. Um, I also strongly recommend you go to the end of Chapter 10 and go through a couple of those practice problems because that's what we'll be doing for our clickers. So make sure you know in a fine map translation, uh, barycentric combinations, barycentric coordinates, invariant ratios, centroid, uh, mapping of four points, parallel, orthogonal, oblique, uh, omnipotent, and I didn't go through all these words. There's some of these in the chapter. You need to go back and look at those um, if you're not sure what those words, those terms are. Um, we didn't actually talk about rank, but uh, rank shows up for perspective projections because you can end up with, uh, you're now in 4D, but rank 3 has perspective uh, projection implications.